question number one? Uh, from class nine. So it says, uh, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. He was like a flower on the grass, he would pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and, and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich fade away in the midst of his passage. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted and being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of light, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Um, I think Andy did give us a good introduction last time about um, James and the letter itself and how sometimes it's not um, kind of systematically planned to keep on moving and changing uh, the focus and you can actually see that in verse 9 to verse 11 is talking about the rich um, you know, uh, shall, be, shall be humbled um, and then it's again verse 12 uh, to verse um, 15 is talking about trials and temptations and, and a call to perseverance. Um, I'll, I'll closely look at verse 16 and 18 as we go on. But again, you see, uh, it's a little bit change of tone. Do not be deceived. Uh, again, that big thing you say, we are looking at that James is keen to remind the people he is writing to do not be deceived, do not be foolish. Uh, you can't say you believe and yet your actions are totally different. They have to, there must be a congruency there that actually what you say you believe in is translating uh, to that living. Um, so these are a lot of practical things that we can carry from James. So the first thing here in verse 9 to verse 11 is um, the first thing that he talks about. And I was just thinking this in the light of, imagine the people he's writing to. And they seem to be here having a question of how should people who are poor or, and, and the word translated here lowly, um, different version used different, can be translated those who are poor, impoverished, so they are low in terms of status in the society, and these are the rich who are have high status in, in the society. How does the gospel change the way they think about their situation? And he gives an answer and he says, if you're poor, what should be a rejoicing be in his exaltation? What exaltation? What the gospel provides for you. And, and this is even more in line of the future hope that you have in Christ Jesus. That actually, when he comes back, everyone who is a believer, whether poor or rich, will be exalted. And that's the rejoicing that actually the, those who are alone in the society should have. And we're just thinking about it in terms of even us in our know, uh, you know, society. And probably, you know, sometimes uh, when we present the gospel, we say, come to the Lord so that, you know, when you're poor, you become rich. But he doesn't seem to say that. He is saying, actually, when you're lonely, you should be rejoicing. Not because of your situation, your uh, poverty or whatever it is, but actually rejoice that you are exalted in Christ Jesus. That you have a hope in Christ Jesus. And then the rich, how should the rich, you uh, know, rejoicing? They should rejoice in their humiliation or their, them being humbled by the fact that their riches cannot buy them uh, the salvation they need. They can buy everything else. You know, they can buy a good bed, they can buy a blood somewhere, bloody, uh, they can buy a <laughs> But in, when it comes to matter salvation, they are humbled. That money cannot buy salvation. And that's what he's saying. What should your rejoicing be? It should be in the humiliation which comes with the gospel. They tells you, actually, you can't bring those money, that money to God. You have to be humbled to come into the kingdom of God, to actually believe and, and put your faith in Christ Jesus. And it continues from there actually to talk about the rich. Quite interesting how much time or how much 
kind of focus gives to the rich, it, it almost seems like it was a big challenge uh, in the days of James. And he goes on to give this metaphor of the rich being like, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. He is like a flower. And the challenge is, I was thinking, and we also think in our society, the challenge is, when we see the rich, we see a mighty fortress, is it? Mm -hmm. and, and we see guys who are, you know, you see the likes of Jingo and Jege, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jege challenge, you know, that's <laughs> okay. You know, you can't, you can't just get into where they stay. You can't, it's, it's, but that, you know, the whole police force had to go, come and try and break into someone's home. Imagine how hard it was if it was local man. You can't get in there. And they are like this fortress. They have a full security, sense of security. And what he's saying is, remember, you are like a flower. Mm -hmm. And what happens to the flower? Actually, it will pass away. And he goes on to give, to give that analogy of verse 11, that when the sun rises, with its scorching heat and withers the grass, the flower falls. Mm -hmm. And its beauty perishes. So whatever he's putting his hope in, his security in, will actually not you know, uh, with, with the course of time, it will be tested. And what will happen is that actually he will come to a note and he will come to an end. And, and he, does, he does a great turn to probably death. He says, at the end of this all, you know, your money will not stop you from dying. And, and uh, is, it, is it someone who says that actually the rich and the poor have one thing in common? They will all die. Mm -hmm. And this is what probably is reminding them here that don't put your faith in your wealth. It is not wrong to be rich, but don't you put your faith in the riches. And, and, and so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. And we're just thinking, think about how we think about wealth. And today, well, maybe it's good also to think about death sometimes. Think today, if you're to die, everything you own, your clothes, if, you're, if that's you know what you have to do. Between you and your riches, you know your clothes, your phone, your computer. Where will they go? In the midst of the pursuits, they will, they will fade away. And we just wonder whether it's, it's a sobering moment for us to think, even how we treat others when it comes to um, um, matters of class, if we if we may use that. Because all these things, all the cars, land, the rich die, mm -hmm. and they leave them. You will never carry them to the grave. Mm -hmm. And that's a sobering thing. So if the rich in Jesus' time were thinking, well, we are indispensable, they are sobered by the fact that they will die in the course of their pursuits. And they will leave everything they have worked for, uh, like Solomon again says, to be eaten by those who never you know, labored for it. Mm -hmm. Someone joked and said, if you die today and you have cows, tomorrow they will not say we don't want grass. <laughs> they will still be happy enjoying their grass, <laughs> as if nothing happened. <laughs> and also, just imagine how dead is. So, is if someone dies today, uh, when I was reading this, I was reminded my uncle. Uh, I, we buried my uncle last year, October, and it's like forgotten. We, we don't even remember him anymore. I mean, it's rare for me actually to remember. It's only when I see the one that I remember. Oh, She's a, she's a widow. And it can be so fleeting to think that actually to get held up in, in, you know, in the riches of this world, in the four securities, mm -hmm. and also all four passes, mm -hmm. and you don't know what tomorrow holds. And that's why Jesus tells the rich, the, fool, uh, the rich foolish man, today mm -hmm. I need your soul. Mm -hmm. After all this thinking that you can actually put some food somewhere and have a full sense of security and sit down and eat and rejoice, um, so here he does remind us, sober in moment, that actually it's, it's not, the problem is not riches, it's when you're rejoicing, your, your security is in that falsehood of the riches. So the poor rejoice in the exaltation of the gospel, the rich rejoice in the humiliation it brings that actually their wealth is not the most important thing. And then it goes to this bit of triumphs, which is quite, um, um, we know it, I think many people talk about it. Um, and it's a trial. Mm -hmm. um, it's a repetition of probably that PhD in Matthew, that, uh, at the end of Matthew, the PhD that says, uh, <coughs> is the man who, um, you know, uh, faces persecution mm -hmm. because of righteousness. Mm -hmm. And it's almost the same here, but it's the man who remains steadfast and a trial. It will not be easy. 
trials will come. It's not a question of whether they will come. It's a question of when they come, what do you do? Um, it's actually remaining steadfast through the hard times. Uh, and, and, and the promise there, the reason why we should remain steadfast in trials is the promise that there is a crown of life. Um, and again, it goes back to the lowly brother and the rich brother because the, 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 the poor one or the lowly one is thinking, I'm looking forward for an exaltation. I'm looking forward for the second coming of Christ Jesus. I rejoice in that. And therefore, when trials come in my situation, I'm looking forward for that exaltation. I'm looking forward for a reward. And the, and the rich master looks at it and says, this world that I have is not everything. I'm looking forward um, uh, to, the, to, the, to the great uh, you know, glorification when Christ Jesus comes, which for him is a humiliation because he has the wealth that he so much needs, but the wealth cannot um, uh, you know, buy him this glorification. And that's the promise that you need to cling on to. That because there is a promise of a crown of life, today I can face every trial. Mm -hmm. I remember Jesus says, um, uh, when he was tempted, uh, I think it's, it's in uh, John, the one we were looking at the other day, and even in Mark, when he's tempted, um, uh, um, not when he's tempted, sorry, when he's washing the disciples' feet, what encourages him to serve? It's his identity. He knows where he's coming from, and he knows where he's going to. And that makes him know that the, even when I serve today, it doesn't change my, you know, my, my, my identity in Christ Jesus, in God. I can serve. And that's the same thing, that because I know of that promise, on the crown, and the life uh, that is coming with that crown, today I can go through trial. I can go through hard times, uh, because God has promised that. And it goes on to say which God has promised to go so love you. And here probably talking about those who have put their faith in Christ Jesus, the 12 tribes in the dispersion, as James will talk about. And then it goes to this verse that is, um, will raise some question. Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. I think the big question that someone who reads the verse will say, why is he saying God cannot tempt us? First of all, God is not tempted. Um, and God does not tempt us with evil. And yet, he does tempt Abraham, is it? Test. 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 Whoa, this, that's the other interesting thing. Uh, the words used here is actually the same word. Whether it's for trial, test, or temptation, it's the same Greek word. So it's not about it. It's probably using, trying to um, interpret uh, differently. But it's actually the same one. It's actually a test uh, where I, I bring the trial to see whether actually you hold firm. So it can be a test. And the difference is, which is very interesting that that came up, is what's the motivation for the testing? So that God tests us, but his motivation is not to make us fall. Mm -hmm. It's to make us more Christ-like, the, the way the author of Hebrew will say. Um, he disciplines those that he loves. So there will be times of trial. Why? Because he wants to discipline us uh, for, for, for um, to be more Christ-like. So there's that kind of, there's always that, is it a test, is it a temptation, mm -hmm. you know, those kind of, but actually the same word, trial, test, temptation, actually if you look at the way temptation is interpreted, it says a test, mm -hmm. it's actually the interpreted a test that, you know, uh, towards, here, here towards a certain goal, but then he's saying, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, and he gives a reason for, the reason why you can't say that is for God cannot be tempted with evil. And I think the idea here is, if the benchmark for holiness is God, if, if he is the benchmark, if you're saying, uh, let me test whether you succumb to the pressure of lying. Why, why lying? Because he's the one who gives the law, is it? He's the benchmark. And therefore you cannot tempt one who is holy, who is perfectly holy. Because it's his benchmark. It's the one who comes with the, with the rules of the game. So you can't test him. And again, he goes on to say you can't test him with evil. And also, he himself tempts no one with evil. And the idea probably there is to say, if then you say God can tempt someone with evil, you're actually saying there's an essence of him that is evil. 
and yet he is holy. And this is probably the question the 12 tribes are asking here and saying, thinking, hmm, why are we going through all this temptation? God is testing us with all these evils. I says, no, it's not actually God. And he gives the reason why it's not God in verse um, 15, uh, no, verse 14 and 15. But in the contrast, he's saying, verse 14, but in the contrast that God is not testing you and actually you can't taste God, it's actually yourselves and your desires, which speaks to Ephesians chapter 2. What are our three enemies? It's the flesh, it's the world, and it's the devil. And those are the ones who are our enemies, the ones that we are fighting against. And so he's saying here that actually what you're thinking is God doing it is your desires that are bringing these trials and temptation towards you. And how is this putting it? Each person is tempted, is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. And we are all enticed and lured by our own desires, fleshly desires. And that's one of the biggest enemies you have to overcome in our Christian work. Um, our body is weak, uh, so we are tempted every now and then, um, be it either you know, sexually, be it either uh, materially, uh, like the, you know, the, the lowly and the rich person in there. Um, and many other things, probably our state in the society at that point. Um, uh, so we are lured because of all that enticement and, and, uh, and, and, uh, yeah, uh, and temptations. But then, is the problem the temptation? James seems to speak you know, something different. No, the problem is not the temptation. It's not when the temptation comes. It's what happens when the temptation comes. So when then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. So we have those desires. We have flesh desires. Um, you, I was just thinking about it in the sense of, um, you know, when you're talking about homosexuality and heterosexuality. So is the problem the attraction or what you do with the attraction? And I think this is what you feel. You desire, um, if you're a lady, you desire a man, is it? Yeah. If you're a man, you desire a woman. And the problem is not that. It's actually when that desire, you start being conceived it and it gives birth to what? To sin. And that sin leads to death. And it's quite interesting to think that sin leads to death. And, and maybe you can think of um, uh, maybe the grave scenes, uh, someone probably dying because they were stealing and someone kills them uh, or something like that. But also think of other scenes like injustice. When you have injustices in a country, when there's corruption in a country, that's really thinking about our country. The scene of corruption, one, one might think, because I bribed a policeman, and I carried an overloaded vehicle. You know, you're running away. You can actually make more money. But in essence, your action can lead to someone's death. Mm -hmm. we, because it's not just thinking about how death will come to me. It's thinking about how my actions, my desire for wealth, the one that he's saying here, that actually don't put your faith and security in the world. Or think about someone who's given a tender to build um, a driving system in, in, a, in, a, you know, in a slum area. So that when there is floods, there will be no cholera and people will not die. And what do they do? They corrupt their way, they do shoddy work. And there is, uh, you know, uh, a cholera breakout and people die. Sin, desire leads to sin, sin leads to death. Either our own, and it can also be spiritual death. Uh, when we are actually not keen. Uh, and I think the next verse is quite clear, verse 16. Do not be sinned my beloved brothers. Do not be deceived. We can't say we believe and then at the other side actually our actions don't show who we are in Christ. Do not be deceived my beloved brother. And then it goes on to say every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And maybe the thinking there is if God doesn't tempt you with evil in the sense of um, he doesn't think uh, mm -hmm. and then you know, if he doesn't do that then it's actually the contrast is that he gives us every good gift that is his nature he gives us every good gift 
And with that, there's no permission or shadow due to change. That's who he is. And of his own will, um, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of fast food for his creatures. No, the thing there is, think if we were sin well, because we were sinners. He could have said, these guys, there is hopelessness. They can't be saved. But he doesn't do that. He could have done that, but he doesn't do that. And that's why every good gift comes from him. Because he doesn't do that, what does he do? Of his own will. And that shows you who he is. That's why he can't tempt us with evil. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. So you see, instead of leaving us to that desperation and wickedness and death, what does he do? Because he is good, he gives us perfect gifts. Every good gift and perfect gifts from him. He, that's what he does. He gives us a perfect good gift. And that's Christ Jesus, is it? It's a perfect um, good gift. And how does he do that? By the word of the truth. So he speaks his word, which brings that salvation to us. And what, what does that make us? That we should be a kind of fast fruit of his creatures. We are his fast fruit. And that makes it quite interesting to think about it, that it's, it's a great rejoicing for the poor, is it? It's a great humiliation for the rich, because they, they can only be partakers of this if they stop putting their trust and hope in wealth and actually put their trust and hope in God's good gift of salvation. So we should rejoice. We should rejoice as Christians. We should rejoice this morning of what God has done to us, of what God has done for us. And when temptation comes, is to think, hmm, how, 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 I should, I need to keep on standing. I need to keep on